26 miles off the coast of Southern California lies the island of Santa Catalina. A unique team of psychics and scientists has gathered here. Aided by the world's most advanced deep ocean technology, they will attempt history's first experiment in undersea psychic archaeology. Three quarters of the globe is covered by vast oceans. Undersea archaeology faces the problem of discovering artifacts from depths ranging down to seven miles. Low light, shifting sand, and growing coral often obscure the outline of objects beneath the sea. The very act of diving is fraught with danger and difficulty. Man was not made to recover history underwater. Advanced equipment such as this undersea robot and this ocean power generator have solved some difficulties. But even technology cannot answer the most critical challenge. Where to look? Where to find the objects which unlock the closed chapters of our past? Perhaps the answer lies not with machines, but within ourselves. Can some strange and as yet unexplained psychic ability help us to see that which is concealed from ordinary vision? In prehistoric times, Santa Catalina was once part of Southern California. Free from pollution, the island is an ideal location for oceanographers. It is the home of the Institute for Marine and Coastal Studies an internationally renowned center for the scientific study of the seas. It was here that an unusual team of psychics and scientists, known as the Mobius Group, came to demonstrate a never-before-tested psychic ability. Using an extraordinary new research submarine, the team would attempt to prove that man's psychic capabilities could indeed reveal the ocean's secrets. Organizing this experiment is philosopher and parapsychologist Stephen Schwartz of the Philosophical Research Society in Los Angeles. Author of The Secret Vaults of Time, he is determined to see that psychic archaeology is accepted as a modern scientific discipline. He has researched the counts of psychic investigations being used to discover archaeological sites on land. Based on this research, he now posed a startling question. Could psychic talents, he wonders, also be used for the more difficult problem of locating objects on the ocean's floor? To answer this question, he organized Project Deep Quest. I chose the sea because it offered a chance to close all the loopholes. If Deep Quest was going to be successful, the only explanation would be that we obtained information from psychic sources. In 10 years of research, I had examined the work of about 75 scientists all around the world. It had never been done before. Nobody had ever tried a deep ocean psychic archaeology experiment, but I was convinced it would work. As real as a person is the research submarine, Taurus-1. This 34-foot-long, electric-powered, $3 million submersible is perfectly suited for the experiment Schwartz has in mind. With her large viewport, more than 1,000-foot depth limit, and the ability to retrieve objects from the sea floor, Taurus-1 offers the Mobius group a real chance to prove their psychic claims. For months, Taurus-1 has dived off Catalina, carrying out a wide range of marine, biological, and geophysical undersea experiments. Now she will face a task of a different order, to prove that the psychic predictions about an undersea site are true. Al Whitcomb, Taurus-1's pilot, will play an important role if Deep Quest is to succeed. Al, we believe that somewhere in these waters we're going to make a psychic hit. About how far out can we 
and go and get a reasonable day's dive. Well, our first limitation would be the diving depth capability of the submersible, which is 300 meters or 1,000 feet. Uh, after that, uh, considering our toe out and our toe in, I say let's stay within the two mile range, and it gives us a good working day. So it's somewhere over in here would be ideal if we go out that far. This appeared uh, at first hand to many of our boys as just one of those mad ventures. Uh, I did persuade the boys that you know it could be a, it was a viable thing. It was uh, could be fun, and uh, we were going to give these guys uh, all the encouragement we could. For all his enthusiasm, Whitcomb knows from past dives that the odds are against success. We'd spent about 20 days, 20 diving days in the area. We'd covered a lot of ground. We hadn't seen anything other than uh, just a few scraps on the bottom. Uh, it was flat and just a, a few rocks, a few bits of seaweed, and certainly a multitude of fish, but otherwise nothing. Can a newly discovered psychic ability, known as remote viewing or distant viewing, locate previously undiscovered objects? The Mobius team turns to psychic Ingo Swan. Like all psychics selected by Schwartz, New York-based Swan would not describe himself primarily as a psychic. Swan's description would be a painter. He is an artist whose works hang in the Smithsonian Institution. His psychic powers, though, have penetrated 30 feet of concrete and special shielding to stop the functioning of electronic apparatus. He has also accurately described conditions on Mars, Mercury, and Jupiter, which were later proven correct by NASA's space probes. An artist he may be, but it was as a psychic that he undertook Deep Quest's assignment. Well, it takes a lot of guts to accept a challenge like this. Now, Deep Quest, of course, was an ideal type of experiment along these lines where the psychics involved could sort of get into it at a creative level and discover things very distant from themselves and then go find out if they were really there. The task Schwartz assigns the psychics, use your powers to locate an archeological site of your choosing in the waters off Catalina. Identify specific objects within the site, draw pictures of what the objects look like, explain their history. This isn't an easy thing to do. At first, you have to work up to it, you know, and uh, sort of separate yourself from the physical environment and become, as it is, psychic for that particular task and then do it. Swan has never been to Catalina, he is not an expert on nautical history, and has been given no other guidance but the chart and the questions. Using only his psychic insight, he develops a list of items he believes are on the ocean floor. I like that tree. Mm -hmm. okay. Ella Hammond is the other psychic involved. She and Swan are regarded by many as the most successfully tested psychics in the United States. I think that's about right. Like Swan, she has no familiarity with Catalina or marine archaeology. People think of a psychic as somebody who's wearing a turban and uh, has a crystal ball. I don't think of myself as a psychic. I'm a photographer, and I've been very interested in psychic functioning. And um, I guess I've spent a lot of time trying to learn how to be more receptive and more tuned to that other world that exists. To me, psychic is just to really be aware, not things with trappings. So I would rather call it to being very, very aware. I just sort of look at the map, not as much with my eyes as sort of get the feeling of it. And I tend to feel a heaviness in certain areas. I can't describe it any other way. It just sort of gets heavy. And that's where I mark the map. 
One of the charges leveled at psychic researchers is that experiments are rarely witnessed in their entirety by an uninvolved, credible observer. To meet this criticism, Dr. Ann Kale, whose NASA satellite work has gained her international respect, is asked to accompany the team and control all original documentation to avoid charges of fraud. The team is now complete. Reputations are on the line. Over the past 10 years, more than 4,000 dives have been made in this area. Is it conceivable that the most thoroughly studied depths on the California coast can still yield secrets to the past? Only one step remains. The night before the dive, Institute official Brad Veek, himself a career submariner, takes the charts made by the psychics and prepares a composite chart which will be used to guide the team to their chosen target. He is amazed that both psychics have independently selected the same site, a few hundred yards out of a total area of more than 1,500 square miles. There is also a long list of specific objects, including winches, chain, and other remains of a wooden ship which had blown up and sunk. As Vic prepares the composite, Hammett feels impelled to reach out yet again through the dark ocean depths. Driven by an impulse she herself does not understand, there emerges in her mind a clear vision of several artifacts, including an enigmatic block. As with all the psychic predictions, this strange, volunteered insight is logged into the experimental record. Will such a block be there? morning of the dive. Surface control, this is Taurus. Surface go. Roger, all systems checked. Holla secured, I'd like permission to open vents and dive at this time. Taurus, surface, uh, Roger, clear to open vents. Have a good dive. Taurus, Roger, and thank you. results or pictures of an empty sea floor. 10 a.m. Two hours into the dive. This is surface. Any progress? Surface Taurus. Nothing so far. Bottom is clean. Three hours into the dive. This is surface. Uh, any luck? Uh, surface. Uh, negative on that. We cannot find the location, or I guess there's nothing there. Taurus, blow some air from your tanks. We'll try and fix your location relative to the psychic's target area. Surface, Roger. We have your bubbles, Taurus, but you're nowhere near the target area. Taurus, it's now 1200. We've been at this for half a day. To resolve her location difficulties, the Taurus asks the surface ship to lower a sonar homing device. The surface ship is directly above the predicted target. The team knows this is their last chance. They have perhaps another hour to produce a hit, or Deep Quest will fail. Ingo Swan feels he is receiving psychic impressions, and he advises submarine pilot Al Whitcomb. Ingo pointed in a direction and said, go there, go there. 
So I just turned the submersible and drove it along his finger. He pointed to a, a shadow on the bottom, and uh, he said, that's it, that's it. So I said, well, okay, and uh, I extended my articulated manipulator, and dug it into the bottom uh, and pulled out uh, the first artifact. It was astounding because, it, to me, it wasn't there, period. It just didn't exist. It is clear to everyone in the submarine that the object they have found with Swan's psychic guidance has lain undisturbed for many decades. Its heavy encrustation and almost buried position unequivocally demonstrates this. But one object does not make a wreck. Those in the submarine are torn between elation and doubt. Can they find the actual wreck described by the psychics? The search intensifies. That was that contact. Hey, we've got something. It's part of a ship. Hey, we found an artifact! Yeah. 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 It is the wind smoke. You see the drum? Yeah, oh, that's the drum. Her, her. Uh, Roger, we have our first positive contact, a piece of machinery in front of us. And, uh... It gave us the immediate feeling that we're there, right on site. There's no way people throw winches overboard. It had to be from the deck of a ship that went down. Taurus 1 glides over the target area, illuminating relic after relic. I believe we have a ship wheel uh, with a long shaft on it, over. Roger. Still, the team wants more. And go on and investigate other targets, over. All right, you're good. Get back to that. Eh? They decide to make one last pass. Ella Hamid's block. The strange monolith she had predicted. The block was alien to any shipwreck. I approached the block and extended the manipulator to touch the block. The arm just bounced off. I was no way able to penetrate the surface with my claws. Such a unique psychic prediction coming true stuns Schwartz. I'm not sure we'll ever know exactly what it was. The fact is that woman, who was in every way a perfectly normal person, somehow reached out with her mind and accurately saw and was able to draw something that should not have been there. Here was clear confirmation of the psychic's description of a sunken ship. Here were the chains, pipes and debris, and Hammond's block. With nothing more than the psychic predictions on charts and Ingo Swan's on-site guidance for fine-tuning, Deep Quest has made history. If Deep Quest is to have its full impact on science, questions need to be answered. Is the site a known wreck? Could the psychics have read about it in a book? Schwartz turns to Thomas Cook of the Bureau of Land Management. Finding a wreck, even when you know where it is, is an art in itself. It is very, very difficult to get back to the same spot on the ocean floor, even when you know exactly the point uh, that you've seen before. We have had to go through, catalog, and identify all of the existing known wrecks or suspected wrecks, which number better than 1,100 wrecks. Taking a look at the over 53 wrecks reported in the Catalina Island area, I am convinced that there has been no known reported wreck in this area or of a ship of this type. 
Finally, all the information is reviewed by the director of the Institute for Marine and Coastal Studies of the University of Southern California, Don Walsh. Could DeepQuest be a fraud? Uh, there are a lot of difficulties, and I, I don't see that uh, they could have put together such an elaborate scheme because we know diving, we know submersibles, we know oceanography, and they had to beat us across the board in all of these things. But the salting of the site, that is putting these uh, items down that were later described by the psychics, would be a very difficult thing to do because 270 feet of water is uh, clearly beyond the depths of, uh, of most divers. But I'm just saying that uh, from my knowledge of the oceans and ocean engineering and the parameters involved, extremely difficult in this case. Coming up next, agents hunting down a ring of drug dealers get help from a courageous father on FBI, The Untold Stories. Then, History's Crimes and Trials chronicles the career of Army Captain Jeffrey McDonald, a.k.a. the Green Beret Killer. And later tonight, History's Mysteries brings you the story of intelligence mastermind George Washington and his spies of the Revolutionary War at 8 here on the History Channel, where the past comes alive.